Welcome everyone. This is the third webinar in the Nehruk Nazio DER Integration and Compensation Initiative. We are so happy to have you join us today. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Okay, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us um, on the third webinar of the DER Integration and Compensation Initiative. This webinar today is gonna be focused on compensation options for aggregated DER grid services. A note before we get started, this webinar will be recorded and will be available to access after the webinar and we will be posting slides, so you'll have access to those as well. But to start us off, I'm going to be passing it on to Kirsten Verklas at NASIO. Thank you so much, Cara. And thank you um, so much for all of you for attending the third webinar on compensation options for aggregated DR grid services. Thank you also for the Department of Energy for support of this initiative and this webinar. Uh, before we get started with our excellent speakers, I just wanted to highlight um, kind of the level setting of why um, we are embarking on uh, this initiative. And if you want to go to the next slide, we're going to start um, by really uh, kind of highlighting what the problem statement is that we, NASIO and NIRUC, are trying to address. Um, you all are certainly aware of this. I don't think I will be telling you anything new, but the current and anticipated growth of uh, distributed energy resources or DERs and the introduction of aggregated DERs into the wholesale market as a result of for quarter 22-22 is really fundamentally changing the way that the grid is planned and operated. And so you all, policymakers at the state energy offices and regulators at the public utility commissions are increasingly asked to evaluate, consider, and establish the rules and requirements around these aggregated DERs, as well as enabling policies and programs to bring those resources online safely and fairly to provide retail and wholesale services. And compensation is certainly one aspect um, of this consideration. So there's a lot of technical and economic issues that you are facing and that will require new information and tools to make these informed decisions that you're being asked to make related to the connection, technical operation and compensation of aggregated ERs in the distribution bulk power system and wholesale energy markets. So with this in mind, um, Nehru Ganazio started the DER integration and compensation initiative, and I will turn it over now to Jeff to talk a little bit about what this initiative is before we get into the webinar. Jeff. Thanks, Kirsten. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're always pleased to collaborate with NASIO staff and their members on emerging and complex issues around the evolution of the energy system. Uh, this webinar is part of a new curriculum that builds on earlier work produced by the DER Integration and Compensation Initiative, which goes back to 2022. Um, our focus is on aggregated DERs, and as Kirsten said, spurred in part by Order 2222, but also on all the technology and policy developments in this space. Um, our objective um, is to help our members, NASIO members, NARUC members, with the important decision making that they are in the midst of and will continue to be in the midst of around how DERs will be integrated into the electric system. Um, and those are really going to determine the direction and possibly the success of more widespread reliance on DERs for um, the various regions and services and uh, benefits that they provide. Um, this is, uh, you know, our efforts to do this are supported in part by bringing different perspectives to contribute to the discussion. So these webinars are part of that. Uh, we're aided in this group by a small group of advisors um, from both um, our state energy offices and utility commissions representing 10 different states across the country, um, both within and outside of RTO ISO regions. So again, looking for a diversity of perspectives. Um, the advisor group is helping us identify issues that are of greatest interest and most need uh, to our members, but that doesn't mean um, that your input isn't also uh, valuable. So if you have suggestions or recommendations or feedback on these efforts, please reach out to me or to Kirsten so we can continue to provide valuable resources for you. Um, we have a website. Uh, we will put a link to the website um, in the chat. 
Um, we have a question already about slides. They will be available on the website as well as a recording. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to, I guess, Kara, and um, we will see you uh, later. Great, thanks, Jeff and Kirsten. Hi all, Kara Goldenberg. I'm a principal on RMI's carbon-free electricity team. And I'm joined here today with a few of my team members as well. And we are so excited to be working with Nehruk and Nazio on this exciting initiative. Um, but for, before we get started with today's content, we wanted to give you a, a, brief, a brief overview of what we have planned um, over the next several months with the DER Integration and Compensation Initiative. So here you see a curriculum that we've developed that is designed around three consecutive modules. The curriculum um, will take NARUC and NASIO members on a journey from being what's done today on DER integration and compensation in module one to emerging topics and how these can be applied to policy challenges with specific coverage of federal funding, DER interconnection and integrated distribution system planning in module two. And then the final module, which will focus on a single theme that will be identified from discussions across module one and module two, and will explore what might be next for DER integration and compensation through collaboration. I wanted to note that we plan to use different modes of engagement through these different modules. As you'll see, module one is um, essentially a series of three webinars. Module two will be using a hybrid model of a webinar and a workshop that will give um, you all more opportunities to interact with the content and with one another. And then module three will be a um, focused around in intentional collaboration, giving you guys the opportunity for generative dialogue and for group problem solving. Next slide. So today we're covering aggregated DER compensation approaches. And this is the last webinar of our first module here. Um, today's webinar builds on webinar one, which covered aggregated DER grid services and webinar two, which focused on valuation of those services. Further information about these past two webinars can be found on the NARUC website that you can see on the slide here and that one of my team members will add to the chat so you can check those out. Next slide. So today's objective is to discuss different aggregated DER compensation approaches. That is how to effectively pay for grid services and the financial mechanisms involved in doing so. We'll specifically cover the policy trade-offs around various approaches such that policymakers can understand their options and the strengths and weaknesses behind different compensation mechanisms. We're very fortunate to be joined by an excellent panel uh, moderated by Vermont PUC Commissioner Riley Allen, who will um, offer some opening remarks on this topic in just a moment. We'll then hear from Travis Kavula of NRG, who will provide an overview of different approaches to aggregated DER compensation. And then we'll have an opportunity for a short, Q, a short Q and A after his presentation. And this will then lead us to our panelists for the day, Pete Polanski with the Hawaii PUC and Carmen Best with Recurve, who will provide presentations on their experiences with different compensation mechanisms. Commissioner Allen will then pose some questions to the panel before opening it up to audience's questions. Please use the Zoom Q&A tool to submit questions throughout the webinar. We will be moderating those. Those questions that are easy to be answered, we will go ahead and answer those in writing. But those who provide more that require more discussion, we will uh, verbally uh, provide those to presenters and be able to have a conversation. And with that, let's hand it over to Commissioner Allen. So uh, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Um, uh, yeah, so uh, thanks so much for uh, inviting me to participate with the, the panel. I think it's an excellent topic. It's a, a very timely topic, I, I know, because we actually have several proceedings uh, in Vermont that kind of overlap with, with this topic. And I know 
from the webinars uh, that I've listened to uh, or read through from the uh, the the December events that uh, in fact this is this is a long road and I think that we're at least from my perspective uh, very much at the early stages of recognizing the needs, uh, understanding the full range of services that are potentially available from uh, aggregated uh, DER, um, but uh, also recognizing and exploring uh, alternative pathways for uh, compensating those, those resources. And I think understanding the dimensions of services and the uh, opportunities for uh, and strategies for compensating is a very timely and, and important topic at, at this time. If you haven't uh, had a chance to uh, look at the earlier webinars, I, I think they're uh, they're excellent, and I, I encourage everyone to go back and understand, you know, the uh, the needs, the services that were kind of featured in the first webinar, and then uh, pathways to valuing those uh, those uh, services is a very important topic. So I'll uh, move on and introduce the first uh, presenter. Um, I think, um, I feel like he almost needs no introduction. Um, I know him as a former neighbor uh, president, but uh, Travis Cavula is the vice president of regulatory affairs at NRG. Travis's guides, uh, Travis guides NRG's regulatory policy related to wholesale and retail electricity, gas, and environmental attribute markets at the federal and state level. Uh, Travis is also a lecturer at the University of Chicago, holding a seminar on electricity market regulation in the US uh, prior to joining NRG. Travis worked at the R Street Institute, was a member of the governing body of the Western Energy and Balance Market, and served as a commissioner at the Montana Public Service Commission. So welcome, Travis. Uh, thanks so much, Commissioner, and great to be with you all to see some familiar names among the attendees, as well as a lot of people I don't know. Um, and it's always a, a great opportunity to be able to kind of talk and try to level set this presentation for today. Um, I, I've sort of divided my remarks into some um, high-level overview slides that sort of present um, my thinking uh, as a sort of how to organize this topic generally, I, I, as you'll see, I tend to divide compensation between price-focused compensation that tends to push down toward the consumer or to the aggregator, uh, and then alternatively, um, utility programs, uh, which stack values and convey um, values through utility regulation and, uh, and a particular utility incumbent um, to uh, DER aggregation. So I hope to sort of present the the theory behind that, um, but perhaps as importantly, uh, a lot of case studies, some of which I'll go through pretty quickly um, because all of these slides will be online. If we go to the next slide, important to note, not the first rodeo with any of these topics. They draw uh, on a lot of prior work done um, and Nehruk in particular, um, dating back years, has done um, a lot of uh, work on how to compensate, in this case, individual um, distributed energy resources, not aggregations, but the same principles of compensation apply, uh, even if questions about how to gain access to the market for aggregations may be different. Um, on the left, you'll see uh, a report, a manual um, from the NARUC staff subcommittee on rate design uh, that dates back to 2016. My understanding is that RMI is working on an update uh, for sort of the latest breakthroughs and technologies associated with this topic. Um, and then you'll find a lot of the thoughts I have to present today more fully described in my uh, tartly named Why is the Smart Grid So Dumb uh, white paper, which was published uh, this time last year uh, by eSIG. Um, and in addition to what uh, uh, Commissioner Allen has described, uh, you know, I think my biases are fully disclosed uh, as, as uh, presenting from a competitive retailer point of view, but I have tried to be neutral in this presentation. Um, and uh, uh, and, and source things broadly from across the community. So turning to the next slide, uh, really the first substantive one, and, and this is sort of the big picture view that I have, um, where if you put aside the technological aspects of individual DERs, 
fundamentally what they're all doing is changing the shape of demand uh, to obviate consumer use at certain times in favor of other times or reducing use altogether uh, by using less energy during particular high price times, uh, as well as putting energy sometimes back onto the grid when the consumer has a surplus uh, due to a resource that they have at hand that produces energy uh, or stores energy available for its discharge. So all of these services um, can both reduce what economists call short-run marginal costs, uh, the megawatt hours of energy and the megawatts of ancillary services that are needed to keep the grid in balance near to real time, but also ultimately they can defer capital investments in generation capacity or transmission or distribution infrastructure by reducing demand uh, over the course of time at particular locations or systemically across the grid. However, in order to do any of that, uh, the idea that changing the shape of demand um, uh, is a worthwhile concept requires some kind of corresponding value for uh, supply prices that vary over time. That's the bogey that you're aiming at when you try to get demand off the grid is what would alternatively supply cost if you were going to use it. Um, in the wholesale markets that exist throughout North America, uh, those prices tend to be innately time varying. Uh, a megawatt hour of energy purchased at one location in a particular wholesale market is going to cost something different at 11 a.m. than it does at 11 p.m. And it's going to vary over space as well. The question there in terms of the wholesale market is whether DER aggregations can actively access those prices. And then alternatively, looking to the retail market, which is what uh, most states have exclusive jurisdiction over, prices there tend to be flat um, historically. They don't reflect the underlying cost characteristics of that upstream wholesale market, um, but that is slowly changing as more retail rate designs are introduced that have time varying uh, characteristics. So that's the story on prices and how you might use prices to get at demand flexibility that's available through DER aggregations. But if you don't have access to those prices, there's another way, which is that a regulator or a utility can manufacture an indirect way to convey value for DER's demand shaping services, which is to say a program. So we'll be talking about both of those pathways and their various nuances when we get to the meat of the presentation. We go to the next slide. Um, it's important to note um, that uh, recent trends in supply, uh, as well as demand, supply becoming more volatile and intermittent due to the growth of renewable resources and demand growth uh, through electrification that's driving up uh, net of net, the peak demand in many markets indicates that the, the demand side of the market should have an increasingly obvious role to play. And this is certainly not just a theory anymore. You see uh, a number of ways uh, in which prices matter, uh, according to the people who are trying to keep the grid in balance. Um, I took note um, of it's, it's about a year and a half old at this point, um, but PJM's white paper on the energy transition notes that if you got retail rate design to a place where uh, load shape was shifted, uh, you would be ultimately tripling the value of solar coming online for capacity purposes in the PJM market. Um, in Maryland, uh, you've seen a comprehensive study done around time of use pricing that indicates that uh, time of use pricing that uh, directly faces retail customers can reduce um, peak demand by 10% or more um, in the peak months um, of the PJM grid. And then finally, you see uh, New York, which has a very ambitious climate agenda, um, estimating steep reductions in the increased cost of decarbonization um, if you did have more efficient rate design. Whereas if you just put on a lot of megawatts of demand onto the grid uh, without those price signals being conveyed to demand to flex, uh, you would ultimately end up with a cost that's uh, one and a half times uh, what, what it really should cost to decarbonize uh, the New York electricity economy. So let's move on um, to discussing prices first. And there's two components of this. Uh, what do retail prices convey uh, versus what can wholesale prices convey? Um, in it beginning sort of on the left, the right hand side rather, uh, the basic principles of economics uh, sort of suggest that prices in a competitive market disregard the sunk costs 
uh, if what it costs to produce the last widget needed to satisfy consumer demand is $5, then in the competitive market, the price is going to be $5. Um, but that is the last not how uh, rate making for monopoly services tends to work. Um, that is that economic principle tends to be well reflected uh, usually in the wholesale markets for energy and capacity. Um, those are marginal cost based auctions uh, that reflect marginal cost um, for a given interval of time, the real time electricity markets every 15 minutes or every hour in the day ahead market um, for capacity at a, at a bit longer of a time stamp. Um, and then transmission rates coming out of the wholesale market really reflect some of the principles that are more associated with retail rates, uh, which themselves are prices, but are subject to a different model of economics. Um, and fundamentally, they're about recovering, if we look to the left-hand side, uh, uh, collecting the embedded cost structure uh, of a utility. So a century old problem in utility regulation is really how to align rates more with marginal cost, uh, which should allow demand to participate and thus reduce energy usage during times when marginal costs are highest. Um, in retail competition, um, some of the aspects of rate making are substituted by retail competition, uh, which can take on a dynamic uh, that's more associated with marginal cost pricing. But fundamentally, if you're engaged in the act of rate making and the collection of a revenue requirement, which is what uh, NARUC members are are all about, um, then, uh, fun then you're fundamentally uh, engaging in the question of how do I recover not just the marginal cost of energy supply, um, but all of the things that the utility has invested in. And a key question when we're using um, rate making powers uh, to set prices for demand, to encourage demand to be flexible, as well as to be fairly compensated, is how to take those embedded costs and reflect them in the prices that face demand. And the primary way we do that, turning to the next slide, uh, is by time of use prices. Um, and we'll, we'll get into exactly how you take uh, cost elements um, that are embedded in traditional rate making and reflect these uh, in time of use rates. But I just wanted to show this example um, from one of the jurisdictions in North America ha that has the longest running experience with this, uh, the province of Ontario, um, to give you a sense. Uh, Ontario has long had uh, relatively flat two to one ratio time of use rates, which is the lighter blue bar um, on this slide. It's recently um, moved uh, to an opt-in rate with ultra low overnight rates to induce the adoption and the flexibility of electric vehicles. Uh, that features a breathtaking 10 to one ratio of on to off peak prices. Um, and you better believe that consumers are going to cause the demand that they have in their houses to respond accordingly, both EVs and other devices. Um, going to the next slide, deserves to be noted that generally conveying these more time limited, nuanced prices to consumers, not always, but generally requires the adoption of advanced metering infrastructure that can actually read customers' energy use at a more granular time interval. And across the United States, we've seen um, a growth in the deployment of AMI infrastructure at a relatively high clip. Uh, about 75% of customers now have AMI deployed uh, at their residences, um, but only 3% of customers um, are faced, uh, and this is a couple of years old, this data point, with time of use pricing that indicates um, uh, any differentiation in the prices they use. That number is, however, increasing, and that's primarily due to the five states that are highlighted here that have decided to adopt time of use pricing as the opt-out rate. Um, in other words, consumers on residential service served by utilities have to take time of use pricing unless they actively decide not to and let their utilities know. And I've indicated uh, those states as well as the year in which the decision was made um, to, uh, uh, to adopt that policy uh, implementation is delayed uh, in some of these places over the course of time. Though in California uh, at this point, um, it's fully rolled out. Um, if we go to the next slide, that way, there we go. Um, this is just an illustrative rate. I want to I want to stress that this is not an actual time of use rate, but this is how a state regulator might put one together uh, in conventional rate design. Uh, and I've decided to pick on National Grid in Massachusetts uh, simply because they have um, uh, New England has uh, a significant variation 
um, in on and off peak energy pricing and seasonality to its energy pricing. And it also has very expensive transmission uh, costs. So in this model, I, I've, I've taken the NARUC uh, manual on cost allocations advice and classified all transmission as demand related. Um, I assume that demand, peak demands will occur during the on-peak energy hours. Um, and I've and I've allocated all of the transmission costs of the grid, as well as all the capacity costs of the grid, as well as the actual on-peak energy prices, as opposed to the off-peak energy prices, into the on-peak rate that a consumer might pay uh, if they were a Massachusetts national grid customer. And then I've taken the non-demand related price component um, uh, in utility service uh, supply costs, and I've just left that as the off-peak price. Um, so here you can see in summer, you would achieve a four to one ratio of on peak to off peak pricing. If you adopted this time of use rate, you would achieve about a three to one ratio um, in the winter time. Again, sending a, a price signal um, that tells people to get off the grid, get reduce or shape your usage outside of on peak price intervals um, uh, during those on peak hours. Um, and I've, I've put on the right hand side just an indication um, of uh, of how peaky uh, the the energy pricing and the supply conditions can get in New England, which is heavily dependent on oil. This could justify not just the time of use price, but some kind of critical peak price that conveys to consumers that they were using energy during a particularly um, dirty time uh, to be consuming uh, power. So let's walk through in the next few slides just some real life examples of uh, consumer facing rates that are present. Um, uh, that, that use prices to induce demand flexibility. Uh, here we have Octopus Energy, a, a large retailer in the United Kingdom and around the world. Uh, only in Texas does it do operations in the United States, but it uses a fully dynamic rate where the consumer uh, is exposed to real-time wholesale prices uh, for anything the consumer uses, and it receives this consumer receives a bill for that on the left-hand side, as well as anything the consumer exports to the grid and, a, and the consumer receives a bill credit to the right-hand side. These are invoices literal, literally for just a single day of service uh, for imports and exports uh, for a consumer that uh, seemingly, given the right-hand side, uh, has adopted rooftop solar. Um, this, if we go to the next slide, um, this type of pricing was present in the United States and Texas during winter storm URI. Um, and I think for every single residential customer who is subscribed to one of these plans, there was probably a news article about the type of bills that uh, they were on the hook for. So generally, at least if I were to recommend uh, things to people, uh, having that price signal is important, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be borne by the end use customer. There's a role for an intermediary to play uh, so long as that intermediary can actually have an active role in shaping consumer demand. And so if we go to the next slide, um, this is something the California PUC has put forward where uh, there, there would be a kind of hedge or protection against full consumer demand exposure to real-time pricing. The consumer in question here would sort of subscribe uh, to their average uh, demand as represented by the blue bar at a particular predefined rate design, a time of use rate that has less volatility than the real-time wholesale price. But then for any deviations outside of that ordinary demand, uh, the utility consumer would uh, pay or be credited at the actual prevailing wholesale cost that tends to be more volatile. So think of it as an insurance policy uh, or a data cap, if you will, that has overruns and rebates if you use more or less data. Um, and, and I think California is doing some of the most innovative things uh, when it comes to rate design, when it considers things like this. Another example, if we go to the next slide, uh, New Hampshire Electric Cooperative said, well, maybe we don't want to expose the uh, consumer's entire premise um, to real-time wholesale prices, but what about just exposing their batteries or their electric vehicles or their smart thermostats uh, for heating and cooling? And this reflects... Uh, um, a sort of device specific rate design where devices are submetered in order to get access to that. Um, generally, the policy here has been only sign up those appliances and devices that can automatically react uh, so that consumer intervention is not necessary in order to gain value um, out of this kind of system. And then if we go to the next slide, we've seen a lot of evolution in the competitive retail market where 
a retailer like my company is fully exposed to the wholesale price, and we may decide to hedge it in whatever way we see uh, we find comfortable with. Um, but then we sign fixed price retail contracts uh, with our end use consumers. Um, but uh, that contract will include a provision that allows us to, with the consumer's consent, to flex their smart thermostat, for example, in exchange right. for a rebate. Um, so that's an example of this of this kind of policy. If we move if we move on briefly to wholesale pricing, um, so we've been talking about retail pricing, the kind of rates and policy structures that state regulators set up to convey to retail customers. There's also a story to be tell, told about wholesale pricing. Here we see um, aggregated demand response, which has been around since for you know a couple of decades almost at this point, um, and the ability of aggregations on the demand response um, front to participate actively in wholesale markets. Um, if we turn to the, if we, it's important to note, and we can turn to the next slide as we're doing that, that states do have the ability to veto the presence of demand response aggregations, and some states have decided recently to remove that veto. Uh, which is an important point of liberalizing the market. Um, however, we have seen in a lot of markets these revenues from these DR aggregations decline in tandem with declining capacity prices on the restructured RTOs, PJM being a typical example of a business model where uh, capacity revenues has been kind of the bread and butter of aggregations and has declined over time as, as capacity uh, prices have fallen due to supply and demand fundamentals. Order 2222, meanwhile, if we turn to the next slide, um, would extend the principles of DR aggregation um, to uh, all distributed energy resources. It doesn't have a state opt-out, but it is limited only to the RTO regions of the country. And those RTOs have candidly been all over the map about uh, when they plan um, to use, uh, when they plan uh, to have this, um, uh, this policy that's been passed by FERC. Uh, in effect. So stay tuned. Some of some of these RTOs like California were kind of already there even before FERC issued Order 2222. Others have basically done nothing like MISO um, and don't intend to do anything for a good number of years. So uh, at least from, from my perspective, uh, it is actually probably more reasonable to uh, expect evolutions in retail pricing uh, controlled by state regulators to convey strong price signals to DER aggregations than it is to wait on the feds and wait on the RTOs uh, and in order to get the prices uh, achieved at the wholesale level and access uh, to be achieved there. So going to the final slide in the pricing, um, is the price right? Um, I think price-oriented ADR businesses uh, in order to make their business model work, they need prices that are time varying. They need prices that reflect marginal cost rather than being flat and non-time varying. And the fact remains that in most states, uh, most prices are flat and you don't have adoption, ado widespread adoption of time of use rates or even more peaky rates uh, to indicate value for demand flexibility. Um, second, it's important if you're going to use prices that they express the full range of value um, for ADR, not just energy pricing, but also transmission and distribution pricing. And then finally, retail competition and RTOs tend to be quite useful um, if you're going to have price-oriented ADR. Um, it's not necessary that you have retail competition in an RTO, um, but those, those institutions do promote innovation and remove certain barriers that are otherwise present in the vertically integrated incumbent utility business model um, that, that will tend to restrain uh, the ability to dem of demand to find value. And the one asterisk about that is, of course, if you are a vertically integrated monopoly regulator, you can nevertheless cause your monopoly to adopt uh, time of use rates to signal the value of uh, ADR. So let's move to programs very briefly. An alternative, if we go to the next slide, to supplement incomplete prices um, is a program. Uh, maybe you don't think for whatever reason that prices are a good way to efficiently allocate scarce resources. Um, I would disagree with you and I welcome the debate uh, if you hold that view, um, but I, I think it's safe to say that uh, in many places around the country, we actually don't use prices for electricity uh, to emphasize the value of demand. And if you don't do that, then you can always stand up a program uh, to do what prices uh, could be doing, probably should be doing. And that may be particularly appropriate where there are specific needs that need to be met um, with ADER. 
Um, typically, in these programs, incumbent utilities um, rely on ratepayer, other ratepayer funding uh, to somehow subsidize them or to stand them up. Um, but there's also examples where competitive retailers offer what looks like a program or where RTOs make targeted solicitations outside of their ordinary markets uh, for what you could call a program. So turning to the next slide, um, I'm just going to walk through quickly a couple of case studies here. Um, probably the most common example is a, a, a rebate or a subsidy to a consumer um, uh, in exchange for uh, the customer adopting and allowing the utility to control its smart thermostat. Um, this is the one I happen to be enrolled in here outside of Washington, D.C., where I can select a level of cycling on, on a smart thermostat that my utility has given me in exchange for an, uh, an upfront and then a recurring annual rebate on my bill associated with that uh, level of control that I've ceded to the utility. Um, candidly, this is pretty generous, uh, $80 and a new smart thermostat uh, in my case. Um, uh, and, and this is a program that unlike the one I talked about in the prices uh, that relies on other ratepayers to subsidize the payments I'm getting. Uh, it doesn't have to stand on its own sort of economic two legs in relation to the wholesale price value. Um, like uh, programs in the competitive market might have. Um, the next one, um, a lot of utilities are going beyond, next slide, a lot of utilities are going beyond smart thermostats and going to batteries um, using the same kind of theory. This is one out of Commissioner Allen's uh, state of Vermont, where Green Mountain Power is paying an upfront subsidy um, in exchange for uh, essentially 10 years of control over a customer adopted battery, so that gives uh, that gives that gives um, customers a big upfront payment, um, at which can reduce the cost of their battery, um, and then it conveys to the utility for planning and other purposes the control over this battery for a long time to come. And I've just stacked up on the right hand slide what that kind of looks like for a consumer. Obviously, a one time rebate is going to be um, a lot better for DER adopters from a financial perspective, but it probably puts more risk on ratepayers uh, associated with um, performance and usefulness and overall efficiency of that investment. You can compare that to an annual incentive, um, which we'll show in just a moment, and then the kind of price stacking that I was describing in the first section. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, an alternative to just paying an upfront subsidy for adoption are utility programs that pay for performance. Um, this one from the Connected Solutions program uh, pays people for the actual kilowatt performance of a battery when called upon by the utility, um, but then it locks the payment of that particular per kilowatt incentive in for several years at a time. So a kind of balancing act between um, performance and uh, the uh, the generosity or or fixed payment nature of the incentive, um, and then finally important to note that certain in the next slide certain RTOs have programs as well. Uh, this is a classic example out of ERCOT, uh, which has a demand response program that sits outside of its markets for energy um, and and, uh, and is available for demand response. Um, so summing up, this is the final slide going to this uh, comparing programs versus prices. Uh, what are programs? They're utility subsidies for device adoption. They're sometimes procurements for targeted needs. What are prices? They, they are time varying retail rates that state regulators set. They're the wholesale markets, capacity, energy, ancillary services auctions, as well as the transmission rates that the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission sets, all of which can be used to build up the value of an ADER in response to particular grid needs. The how? Uh, through through programs, it tends to be exclusive, uh, you know, single docket proceedings associated with uh, utility programs. Uh, for prices, there's both market design where auctions are spitting out prices uh, based on supply and demand fundamentals, but also rate design for things like transmission. The business model, and here I'm talking about the, the aggregations business model, for programs, they tend to basically be a utility vendor. Um, they have to have a customer base, perhaps, of people who have their technology, but fundamentally they're gaining their value out of the utility, sort of a single gatekeeper model for ADR growth. Whereas in, a pr in prices, the growth can be more organic um, and there's a le bit less uh, intermediation on the part of a utility. The ADR is a bit more of a free agent. 
And finally, the pros and cons. Programs, as I said, it's a clear value target. They tend to be more generous uh, because they can rely on other ratepayers to subsidize them, but they come with certain limits on the quantity and pace. You require a regulator to sign off on the program, after all, and to make any modifications. Uh, and then for prices, the pros and cons are, again, a more open market, but less stable revenue, as well as questions on how to monetize if you're the ADR. If I'm an ADR assisting a consumer responding to time of use prices, how do I get some of that money to help my business model make the investments in demand flexible technologies? I don't mean, as a final note, to make these things mutually exclusive, um, but, uh, but I, I, they can work with one another. But I do think they represent the kind of uh, philosophical divide that exists when we talk about compensation for DERs today. Uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, if we have any time for questions, I'd be happy to take some. Uh, if, uh, thanks, uh, Travis. Yeah, we're, we're uh, running a little tight on time, but I, I did want to uh, cover uh, at least uh, one question. Was, there was one question that uh, was really about, um, you know, time bearing uh, pricing and equity uh, consideration. So, uh, implications for low income customers relative to higher income customers. And I'm gonna couple that with a question that I had around uh, the opt in versus opt out uh, framework. And um, you know, essentially uh, the, if you can kind of touch on uh, both of those topics, uh, you know, the importance of one versus the other and uh, how they can apply and be relevant to conversations about low income rates. Yep, absolutely. So uh, I'll take the uh, opt-in, opt-out first. Um, I think we've seen in places which have tried to do time of use rates by opt-in a very low percentage enrollment in it, either because it's not well marketed um, or, or for any number of reasons, candidly. But I think the best one is probably summed up by just a learning we've had around behavioral economics, which is that the default choice, the thing that you're defaulted into, sort of... Uh, is the, is the normal course of business that most customers um, will perceive as the correct or proper choice, even if in this case, it does not reflect the underlying cost structure of the service that you're taking. So you're essentially asking people to opt into a more complex, but also more correct uh, pricing structure um, if you're going to have opt-in TOU rates. So I'm a big believer in having the prices uh, right. And then if people want to kind of have a flat rate or buy insurance or do something that kind of gets them off that rate, they should have they should be they should have to take the proactive step of adopting a more simple rate design. As to low and moderate income consumers, um, that Maryland study that I referenced, which was done by Brattle Group, is really illuminating. Um, they saw equal or better performance on the part of low income customers uh, to sending that time of use rate. Um, I think that makes sense, uh, probably because energy uh, use is a higher percentage of consumers' disposable income in those income brackets, um, and it's easier to shape consumer demand um, wh when you're actually sensitive to that kind of cost, whereas higher income earners may, may have more automated devices that allow them to respond, um, but they're also probably less price sensitive. Um, than those customers. But the empirics of it seem to demonstrate um, that low-income customers um, have an equal measure of response um, to, and, and ultimately then, higher savings as a result of time-of-use rate adoption. Okay, thanks, uh, Travis. And we do, we'll have time for more questions at the end. I did want to get through our two other panelists. Thank you. Uh, Pete Polanski is a, a utility analyst at the Hawaii Public Utility Commission. Uh, where he's worked for the last uh, three and a half years. He works on a range of issues at the commission, including grid planning, distrib distributed uh, energy resources, energy equity, renewable energy procurement, and performance-based regulation. He has been heavily involved in uh, with the development of the upcoming DER programs that are launching in Hawaii. Welcome, Pete. Thanks so much for that introduction, Commissioner. And thanks to Nehru Kinesio for putting this on. And I think Travis's uh, presentation is a really good overview of the environment we're working in. And hopefully I can build on some of the points he was making within the Hawaii context. And I'll just note, so today I'll be talking about DER grid service compensation in Hawaii. Um, yeah, here's a, here's a general disclaimer uh, as I work at the commission and you can go to the next slide, please. 
Yeah, so a bit on the, the Hawaii context. So as you can imagine, Hawaii has a pretty distinct context uh, for you know the electricity market compared to most uh, utilities and states uh, across the US. We are a set of disconnected islands. Uh, FERC order 2222 does not really apply to Hawaii. Uh, just, just in general, we do not have any RTOs. Um, but I think we have several programs that align with the guidance from FERC Order 2222, at least as I understand it, to enable aggregators and aggregated DERs to better participate in the DER market and to better enable DER adoption. And just building a little bit off of, off of Travis's note, I think the on the pricing program divide, we've really taken the approach in Hawaii to, you know, or the perspective that prices and programs can work in conjunction with each other to enable DER adoption and incentivize DER use in a way that benefits the grid. That's the sort of uh, foundational perspective we've, we've taken in developing our next generation prices and programs. Um, and there are, there are several programs today that I, I may not get a chance to touch on that work in this area on aggregated DERs and grid services. We do have TOU rates launching this year. We do have competitively bid aggregator con contracts that have been phased in over the past several years. But the three that I'll be talking about today and, and later slides focus more on the, the role of DERs in the grid of the future and how we in particular have developed compensation options to reflect that role. And so I just provided a few uh, graphs here regarding Hawaiian electrics. Uh, general portfolio and solar installations over the past 10 to 15 years. Hawaiian Electric is the utility that serves 95% of customers in Hawaii. Uh, we do have a separate co-op that serves the island of Kauai. Um, and if, if you if you look at these graphs, you can see that we we are pretty far in our journey for solar in the context of you know how large Hawaii's grid is. We have over 1.1 gigawatts of solar installed over the past 15 or so years. Uh, for context, the peak load on Oahu ranges from about 800 to 1200 megawatts. And um, Hawaiian Electric has you know, indicated in their planning that they're targeting for another 25,000 plus systems uh, by 2030, which is the next renewable portfolio yeah. standard deadline. And there have been plenty of calls to even vastly accelerate this DER solar adoption that I'm depicting here. So if you could, I think there are a few transitions on this slide. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, oh, sorry, if you go back. So I wanted to give you a bit of perspective on what the program offerings we've had over the past 15 years in conjunct or aligned with these this installation schedules look like. We initially started out with a net energy metering program that was opened in the early 2000s and really began to ramp up around 2008, 2009. It was closed in 2015 due to concerns largely over the impact on the electric grid of so much uh, distributed solar being installed and in particular subsidization uh, of, or cross subsidization of costs by non nem customers. So when these programs were closed, we implemented some post NEM programs that were have always been described as interim programs that generally had lower incentives and less dynamic rate structures. Over the past three or four years, we've undergone the development of what I'm calling our next generation programs that I'll go over in the next few slides that are designed to be more dynamic and encourage battery adoption, shift energy generation to the evening peak as we're experiencing the sort of duck curve that a lot of states with a lot of solar are experiencing and just be generally more flexible for updates as the grid evolves and we have more distributed solar. Next slide, please. So I'll focus first on this battery bonus program, um, which is an emergency program that the commission adopted in 2021 um, as uh, there was an emergency need for replacement resources we had the largest coal plant on Oahu scheduled to retire and a lot of the solar plus storage projects that were set to replace that large capacity were significantly delayed. So there were several concerns about the reliability of the grid during this evening peak, which is when the coal plant was serving a lot of energy. So the commission in conjunction with the parties in our open DER docket engaged in this uh, time constrained process to develop this customer program that provides incentives, uh, three sets of incentives that I'll go over in the next slide. Uh, 
in return for customers installing a new battery connected to rooftop solar and requiring that that customer discharge that battery for two hours during the evening peak every day for 10 years. So to become this sort of consistent uh, load modifier to reduce evening peak, the utility can rely on and serve as one of the replacement resources for this coal plant. And this was largely a commission driven program, but it incorporated ideas from the proposals of each of these, the primary parties in the DER docket, which included the DER parties who you know, represents the installers, installers in the solar industry in Hawaii in general. And that led to the development of the structure of this program, which is uh, the next slide provides a bit more information on. So this program generally has three incentives, a, a very, a, a relatively large upfront incentive in return for the customer's commitment to participate in this program for 10 years, a monthly capacity payment that sort of rewards the customer for ongoing participation and making sure they're meeting the commitment of how much energy they discharge during that evening peak period every single day of the year. And there's also this retail rate energy export credit uh, for exports during the program for the first three years of enrollment. So this is designed for non-NEM customers who were getting a much lower uh, incentive for their energy exports compared to NEM customers to sort of bridge the gap uh, for the this the initial set of the uh, few years of this program before the next generation programs that are designed as that more permanent ongoing programs come online. So I have a, a short example here of what that looks like. Um, and in general, this, this program has been pretty successful in terms of adoption of additional batteries and meeting the identified goals. So the next slide, I have a graph that goes over you know how this the, the capacity of this program has evolved since it was opened in july 2021 and the the original capacity we approved for this program was 50 megawatts we made some changes along the way uh to you know incorporate recommendations from the, the parties in this docket as we really implemented this program on a short basis so we we included in the framework the ability for flexible updates that led to a, a change in the cap to 40 megawatts, which we recently hit in December. And we've also heard from Utility Hawaiian Electric that the, the, this is one of the first times their operations team has you know, begun to assume that these DER resources would be online and a resource that they can rely on and significantly contribute to meeting their evening peak. Um, this was after I think the 15 to 20 megawatt threshold had been hit. And this was exciting for us uh, as a commission as we have pushed um, publicly in our in our decisions and orders for Hawaiian Electric to better integrate DER resources into their portfolio over the past seven or eight years. Next slide, please. So the other two programs I'll, I'll be talking about are these next generation DER programs, which launched this year actually on, on March 1st. And so this slide just gives a brief overview of what this smart DER program is, which is the basic DER tariff that you can think about it as sort of a post-post NEM tariff uh, that customers can enroll on. There are two options for non-export and export. And the export option provides time varying compensation for export. I have an example for Oahu, which is our island with the most customers, uh, what that, that export compensation looks like. We've got the rates divided into three periods and it sort of mirrors to an extent the time of use rates that we are implementing uh, at the same time this year to a uh, subset of customers. So the word that I would use to describe the stakeholder process that led to developing this in the next program is iterative. We had several phases of proposals, record development conferences, um, even commission guidance, and it, and it led us to this point where we were able to figure out what is the need for these programs um, and the associated prices for the grid of the future and how DERs will play a role in this grid. And it allowed us to take into account the perspectives of the utility, the consumer advocate, and the DER parties to develop what we view as this program that'll pave the way for the DER adoption we need to hit our renewable goals, while also being flexible to uh, incorporate updates as the grid evolves and as we better understand what the value of these resources on the grid are. Um, and in, de in developing these programs, we really took into account the proposals from the parties and looking for what are the pain points for existing DER customers and participating in the grid, including compensation options, 
um, and how can we alleviate these, these pain points? Uh, next slide, please. So the Bring Your Own Device program really is, a, is, an, is an iteration of the battery bonus program. It's got a pretty similar incentive structure, just with uh, significantly less upfront incentives um, and you know, building on the additional modeling efforts we had in this iteration of uh, the DER docket to determine what the value of these resources are. We implemented three levels of this program to uh, reflect that customers have different priorities with, you know, the usage of their devices, um, including batteries, uh, and and allow these customers to, you know, have a more dynamic relationship with how the grid serves them and how they serve the grid. And as I said, the incentive structure builds on on battery bonus, but we made several modifications to reflect the the more intense modeling efforts that I'll go over in the next two or so slides. And so we we incorporated the modeling efforts from the ongoing planning process for Hawaii. Um, there were several iterations of this modeling that we incorporated feedback from the commission and from other stakeholders who had some access to the model. One thing I, I wanna highlight here is that we identified in our recent decision in order that there are, sort of, there are about eight applicable DER value streams that should be reflected in DER compensation. And we're kind of setting this up as this is where we want the DER valuation to go in the future, especially as we're updating these programs. And we, if you can go to the next slide, we mapped where existing results of the modeling efforts identify DER value streams and use this mapping process to, to establish the additional incentives that I went over in the previous few slides. But we noted that not all of these streams are represented clearly in incentives. So we established this update framework that I've referenced where some portion of the programmatic structure will be updated every three years after program launch, including the export rates, incentives, and a few other things to, to, to reflect that the grid is actively evolving and programs and prices must be able to keep pace with that evolution. I have a few more slides. I think I'm running close on time. Um, Thanks, so if you Pete. Can just... Yeah, you can go over the, the takeaway slides and then we can move on to Carmen. Thank you. Sounds good. So then I think it's the next two slides. Yeah, so I just wanted to share a few brief takeaways from uh, my work in this area in Hawaii. In developing or in designing these programs, it's it's really a balancing effort to develop DER incentives that you know, provide adequate uh, compensation to customers to support a robust DER market, but accurately reflect the value that DERs provide so that we're limiting this cost shift to other customers. Uh, it was also important to embed iteration and evolution in the program design process and in the program implementation pro process. As I've said, the that electric grids are actively evolving. And we also wanted to, or it's also been important to acknowledge the role of DERs in utility planning processes and make sure that the planning process for the entire grid and the development of programs and prices are consistent with each other. And then just a few more for stakeholder process on the final slide. There's clearly going to be some differences of opinion um, and perspective amongst the stakeholders we're working with here, in particular utilities and, and solar advocates. So it's important to push for compromise between stakeholders. You know, it makes commissioners' decision making easier, but it also uh, allows you know for the best program when you're considering a multitude of perspectives. And to do this, you know, one easy way is to get stakeholders together in the same room to somewhat, you know, force them to address the, the merits of each other's arguments instead of, you know, a lot of the times we have, or a lot of the time we have just back and forth filings that aren't super helpful towards coming to a compromise. And finally, engaging stakeholders early and often can help avoid delays in the process when stakeholders do not feel that they've been properly heard or consulted and identify some, you know, key pain points or, or issues with programs that you're implementing. I think that's it. Sorry for going a bit over time, um, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Pete. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll come back with questions at the uh, at the end. I wanted to uh, move over to Carmen Best from Recurve. Uh, Carmen Best is the Chief Policy Officer at Recurve, a demand flexibility software platform provider. Uh, Carmen leads 
a policy strategy and outreach to open new market opportunities for demand flexibility. Prior to joining Recurve, Carmen was head of evaluation, measurement, and verification at the California Public Utility Commission. Welcome, Carmen. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to contribute today. And I think um, that my comments are really going to be synergistic with the prior two presentations as well. So Recurve is a software uh, company that is offering two core types of services. First is our analytics platform, which is really uh, to understand customers' energy usage patterns from the meter up. And then the second component is being able to standardize and offer a flex market, which is a platform to leverage those analytic tools and most effectively run and value virtual power plants, which is Com combinations of distributed energy resources, right? So both of these solutions are really key to the three components of compensation that I wanted to highlight today, having a price and value like we talked about earlier, um, and then also having consistent measurement and verification and validation mechanisms so that everyone has a common view of what performance is. And then finally, having structures like our uh, the demand flex market that I'm going to talk about that is really technology agnostic and business solution agnostic as well, so that a, a wide range of innovations can come forward to be delivering the value and um, services that are needed to um, to uh, animate the clean energy transition. Next slide, please. So Recurve's purpose in this market is really to drive greater parity between investments in supply side and demand side resources. We believe that compensation really should be as equivalent as possible, but still recognize the unique benefits of each. Next slide, please. So when we're looking at um, you know, where you could be valuing these resources, um, most cases, and this is drawn from my past experience of managing energy efficiency programs, most of the time we're looking at them as a load modifying resource, and we're compensating for the wide variety of the value stack. Um, it is possible to bring them all together, um, and it's being done in a lot of places uh, in an in for the purposes of integrated resource planning, for example, and that type of construct. And it can also be complemented with supply side short-term impacts um, as uh, Travis and others had pointed out in the ISO and RTO sort of contract construct where you're looking at energy capacity and ancillary services. Um, what's exciting about the demand side is that there, there are ways that we can be fitting all of these pieces into the stack. And that's really going to be dependent on the jurisdiction and the entity that's engaged as a market sponsor. I'll highlight that term a little bit later. But we found that it is possible to synergize these and motivate the market to deliver the combined value without having to have a plethora of separate programs running around your state or jurisdiction, which can cause some market confusion. So next slide, please. Envision a scenario where you could have the avoided energy and capacity cost forming kind of that base value of uh, the resource, and then other values could be stacked on top of it. Things like air quality or carbon value, um, things like social goods like equity or resilience or microgrid sort the types of value that microgrids could provide to the grid. And in a uh, program construct, I guess using Travis's term, um, you could even be combining these funding sources to vary. They could be coming from variable sources and they can be presented to the market aggregators to synergize this value for customers and in turn enabling them to go deeper or wider with customers on their individual energy journey and create the cash flows to keep it going, uh, even if one or another uh, sources of these funds kind of dry up, say federal funding, for example. Um, this sort of construct is, is I, I liken it to a uh, sign of the willingness to pay, as it were, for the long-term value that folks can build around for uh, DER solutions that are gonna be meaningful for customers. And one of the examples I wanted to highlight, next slide please, is how we've operationalized this 
construct in the market access model. This too, like the example provided in Hawaii, was, was um, animated by a summer reliability situation in California. And through regulatory uh, filings and, and idea generation, um, the market access program model was put forward as a potential solution for summer reliability. It was really mirrored after Recurve's Flex Market, which was adopted by a CCA in California. And it is funded via efficiency program. So that's kind of the core compensation mechanism. And it's all of those energy funding uh, sources are derived from the integrated resource plan, which is also carbon optimized and leverages the avoided cost curve um, for valuation of all the DERs um, or all the energy efficiency and demand response in, uh, in California. So in a nutshell, the demand flex market is an open pay for performance marketplace where aggregators or trade allies or contractors receive incentive payments for saving end use customers energy. And we're measuring it at the customer meter uh, when and where it's most needed for the grid. So it has a time valuation component to it. And it's also uh, can be optimized around geographic and other demographic metrics as well. Flex markets can include energy efficiency or demand response. They can be electric and gas, or they can also be oriented to greenhouse gas emissions, for example. So all kinds of different devices can be coming into play, different business solutions that are uh, managing devices and are optimizing them in, in different ways can all come and play in this marketplace and deliver value. Uh, the commission recently adopted this within their full efficiency portfolio. And the quote that I added here kind of highlights some of the attributes that they really liked about it. Uh, lowering barriers to entry, for example, um, opening up possibilities to experiment with different types of technologies and compensation structures for uh, utility or for customers was also one of the reasons why they wanted to um, adopt this model. Uh, going forward. So it survived the summer reliability and delivered really big impacts. And then it also um, has been adopted for the long term. Next slide, please. Another one component uh, that was just spoken to in the last uh, presentation too of these continuous feedback loops, one of the ways that we're operationalizing that is making sure that there's a standardized measurement verification framework that's adopted at the outset. So what we're doing is quantifying the change in energy consumption that's derived from both short-term event-based responses and long-term interventions. And then we're able to use that to parse out the value based on the market sponsor's need. So that big value stack, um, th there are components of it that might be short-term, there might be components that are long-term, and then you can add them together to uh, create the aggregator compensation framework. Next slide, please. So what this looks like in practice is uh, essentially there's four parties that are operating in a flex market. There are market sponsors, that's the entity that wants to get this resource for whatever reason they might be needing to do it. The transactional platform provider, measurement, verification, and settlement, that can be typically us. Um, and then there's the aggregators that are providing the services to customers. And then of course there's customers that are busy reaching their own personal energy goals in partnership with aggregators. And all that information is going back to the market sponsor. Next slide, please. So the flex market incentives are anchored in the avoided cost value and then other values can be stacked on top of this. And we have lots of examples of different flex markets doing different types of things, um, depending on the utility or market sponsors needs. And the event-based uh, response payments are offered based on agreed upon rates or price or impact um, that's measured at the site using the consumption data from the, from the advanced metering infrastructure. And payments can be coming from multiple uh, funding sources, but they're essentially seamless for the customer and potentially for the aggregator. All the actors in this market are using the price signal and the performance results to create this positive feedback loop for ongoing optimization and intel of the market to be used in future load forecasting or other uh, analytical exercises. Next slide, please. And it worked. Uh, for this summer reliability situation, the program was able to ramp up very quickly in response 
and delivered about double the system benefit per kilowatt hour than the existing energy efficiency program because it had this coordinated price signal for that peak time of the day. It also had really impressive realization rates, um, it, which means that it was a reliable and predictable way to look at um, how these resources were coming on board and providing value to the system and to customers. Uh, the compensation is dialed in for the aggregators and uh, it means that they were able to make promises to customers that they were also delivering on. So that 102% uh, realization rate is, I haven't seen it in traditional programs before. Next slide, please. Um, and my point with this slide is really that there's lots of different types of interventions that came into play in the flex market. EV managed charging, smart thermostats, stats, et cetera. They all have their own shape but when they're reconciled against a common value and a common price, they can all kind of play uh, in the same sandbox together and deliver value and keep it fairly simple for everyone else, from the regulators to the utilities to the market sponsors. They can really get at that value stream without a lot of fuss. Next slide, please. The program model is really flexible. It's been enabled under this IRP model right now in California, but I see ways that it could be operationalized in pretty much any uh, form for FERC 2x4, 2222, sorry, and um, also uh, the new, new opportunities that are coming up with clean energy buyers and uh, different solutions that could be out there. So as long as you have that price, the consistent m and and open up a technology agnostic or business agnostic model to be able to drive innovation, I think you're really well set. My last slide here, next one, is just, I since we're gonna be sharing these, I wanted to provide some links to examples of these core elements uh, having been adopted already. So when you're looking at that value stream, um, Publishing that value and making that price available. Uh, I think New York's VEDER is one example of that, as is California's avoided cost calculator. Um, but almost any energy efficiency program also has those avoided costs somewhere in their cost test. With respect to the measured outcomes as the default and utilizing MNV, um, it's exciting to see that federal initiatives like the IRA Homes uh, Initiative has a measured pathway requiring open source MNV as well. So that's one way that you can make sure that you're seeing the value of these interventions and can use them as a grid resource. Kansas also recently adopted an order where they said that their efficiency programs need to be measured by default. And they weren't the first, but they're one of the most recent. And I think it's an interesting um, move in the industry to make sure that measurement is kind of a core attribute of these programs. And then finally, making sure that you have streamlined and technology agnostic and business agnostic pathways. I think the market access model that I described here today is a great one, but there's lots of other ones um, that are also out there that are illustrated in integrated demand side management strategies. And then also just general performance-based regulations are also a mechanism by which you can be focusing on those outcomes um, and not necessarily all the prescriptive elements of implementing DER programs. And I will stop there. Uh, I too, apologies for going over a couple minutes um, and I look forward to comments and questions. Well, thanks so much, uh, Carmen. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll just uh, start by uh, uh, going back and asking Travis a question, but I think it's a question that, that could apply to uh, yours or uh, Pete's uh, presentations as well. And I think you may have covered it to a certain extent, but uh, uh, can can you just highlight or, or feature uh, uh, examples of, of programs that include both you know the the price structures that you had called out, uh, but also the more programmatic uh, aspects of that? I mean, can can you create a hybrid that is uh, effective? And are there examples of that? Uh, yeah, I mean, you certainly can. I think that um, California's time of use rates, which are default opt-out rates, uh, and that have a, a few different permutations, are, are clearly influencing uh, when people charge their electric vehicles or the degree to which they adopt programmable devices um, that don't really need to be smart, but they assist in kind of behavioral responsiveness to the uh, relatively static time of use price signals. 
Um, but then there are also programs in California, for example, that subsidize customers' adoption of battery storage resources. Um, and those two things can kind of exist in parallel. Um, they, they can be kind of mushed together, like Carmen is talking about, but they also don't have to be. They can be rationalized by individual consumers' disparate behaviors about uh, what kind of devices to buy and install in their home. So I'd, I'd offer that as an example. I, I mean, in general, you probably will see, um, you know, situations where both prices and programs are effectively pieced together um, in order to maximize the value of, of DER. Thanks, uh, uh, Travis. Uh, uh, Pete or Carmen, do you want to comment on that? Uh, I have uh, other questions uh, to cover in your uh, presentations as well. Yeah, I can just add from the Hawaii perspective that this is exactly what we're doing with these new programs that I, that I highlighted. The I don't think I included in the slides, but one portion or one component of these programs is that customers enrolling on these programs will be defaulted onto the time of use rates as well. So they'll have both the time of use rate schedule when they're buying energy and the time varying export rates when they're sending energy to the grid. So we've kind of integrated them to some extent and use a lot of the same like foundational principles in terms of price, uh, in terms of, you know, the methodology for developing these rates when we're developing both of those programs. Yeah, just to chime in very quickly, I think it's important to have options for customers too. Um, they're going to have different ranges of, of um, interests in uh, giving control of their devices. And I think when you can have options to settle at the meter, it potentially opens up a wider range of interventions, especially for that long-term efficiency play from my perspective. Thanks. And I, I had a question for uh, Pete uh, uh, related to the, the program and the evolution of that battery uh, program uh, to the BYOD program. I, I know that there was a significant uh, kind of recalibration, uh, especially of the uh, upfront um, incentive uh, payment. And I, you know, in my mind, this is just kind of classic uh, rate design, but I, I would appreciate uh, more, a better articulation or more articulation of uh, uh, why that, uh, why that change. I understand that probably the program was overheating, uh, but, and it had a time limit, but uh, I assume that the original program was covering essentially the cost and was cost effective. Um, am I right? Yes, definitely. And and I think it's, you know, the, the original program, we are requiring customers to participate in this for 10 years. And I think as part of that, we can, you know, allow cost recovery to be amortized over that 10 years. So we can allow a higher upfront incentive. It's certainly a much lower upfront incentive for BYOD, and that reflects the additional modeling we were able to do with additional time um, and you know the new resources coming on the grid. We also included a much lower commitment uh, for customers enrolling in that program. So I think that's sort of one reason I think it's you know the, the distinction in incentive levels. It's, it's partially what value we are able to determine from the methodology, but it's also what are we asking customers to do for this program and what is, you know, realistic to expect customers need to enroll in this program based on what we're asking them to do. Thanks, Pete. Now, I wanted to bring the conversation uh, back to, uh, you know, what I think of as, as kind of an actionable uh, level for regulators and, uh, and utilities. Um, I want to uh, just uh, ask the question, are, are there kind of promising uh, next steps or, or pathways that uh, you would recommend utilities uh, that want to be essentially moving uh, more ambitiously in uh, the directions that, that we're talking about to be taking uh, as first steps? I'm going to put that to Travis first. Yeah, well, I, I'll... I'll be the one to pitch time of use rates, I think, uh, since that was such a prominent part of my presentation. I, I mean, I really think it does begin uh, with trying to have rates that don't tell the basic lie to customers that any kilowatt hour you use is the same cost as any other kilowatt hour you use. And frankly, a lot of the programs we've been talking about sort of build on and augment those basic pricing principles. I mean, one of the reasons we don't have 
uh, time or we, we classically have not had time of use rates is simply because we didn't have the metering infrastructure to be able to accommodate that price signal. And now that we do, we, we really as economic regulators, I, I strongly believe we kind of owe it to ourselves to stop <laughs> kind of telling that lie. And it doesn't mean transitioning people to fully dynamic prices that I warned against in the presentation, but it, it does mean trying to send a price signal that on peak energy costs more uh, than off peak energy because that that will shape demand as we've seen in in any number of ways and then programs can help with uh, you know get gaining on the greater adoption of devices um and and ameliorating some of their capital costs um by having more targeted incentives but i, I think it starts with getting the price right and trying to convey that uh you know to your base of consumers at large I'd piggyback on that to say, um, let's use the AMI data that's at our disposal. We're getting to like really high penetration rates in the country. You know, 70% of, of customers have AMI, but not it's not being used for all the great purposes that it could be used for, be that time of use rates, be that uh, time valued energy efficiency interventions, um, the corollary of flat incentives is very much alive and well in the energy efficiency world where uh, fixed deems incentives for technologies, um, it doesn't really tell the whole story of the variable value that could be coming from these resources. So I think that's an important next step and I'm really excited to see a few states uh, considering that and adopting it in the context of a measured performance uh, from their energy efficiency portfolios. Uh, thanks. Um, so this is a, Question, uh, I, I assume it's uh, primarily for uh, Carmen and Travis, since I'm not sure how uh, big an issue uh, transmission is in Hawaii, but uh, you can probably address it as well. Uh, do you know of a preferred a, a standard methods by which uh, utilities calculate avoided uh, transmission costs related to distributed energy resources? So. Uh, can, can we value uh, the uh, avoidance of uh, bulk transmission? Yeah. Or inter Go ahead. Th th this, this tends to be a big piece of the missing value uh, that uh, aggregated DRs, DRs in general, should be paid. In most places around the country, regulators have determined that transmission costs are demand related. Uh, and to give you a, a very specific example of that, uh, you can look to ERCOT in Texas, where uh, you know, the, the transmission grid has a five or six billion dollar revenue requirement, and that's paid and that's allocated to uh, utilities and their customer classes entirely through a methodology called four CP, four coincident peak, which are the 15 minute intervals uh, that are the peak load hours of the four summer months in Texas. Um, if you're a CNI customer, if you're a Bitcoin mine, for example, and you don't use any energy, if you drop your load during those four 15 minute intervals, you pay nothing for transmission uh, in the Texas grid because it's all demand allocated. However, regulators have decided arguably to protect residential consumers that residential consumers should not be exposed to demand-based transmission charges. We have a long experience of either knowing or thinking or believing that residential customers can't handle demand uh, charge exposure. But the, the result of that in practical terms is that residential customers in Texas face a, vol a simple volumetric cents per kilowatt hour charge for transmission, even though those transmission costs have been allocated to the residential customer class on the basis of their demand during those four intervals. So unfortunately, the result in that scenario is that if you're a Bitcoin mine and don't use energy during those four intervals, you pay, as I said, zero for transmission. If you did the same thing as a residential customer, you would only avoid four 8,760ths of your total transmission bill uh, because the prices are volumetric and flat. Uh, rather than demand based. So th that's all to say there's got to be, even if you don't want to expose your residential customers to demand charge, there should be, there has to be a way where those residential customers distributed energy resources should be able to gain the same value of transmission avoided costs that the big CNI customers can. I noticed that questioner comes from Wisconsin uh, because I, 
I, I was sneaky and I Google searched uh, the person. Um, so I, I'll just say it works kind of the same way in MISO, where a lot of the retail regulators will face large CNI customers with a dollar per kilowatt transmission charge. Um, that gives them a big incentive to reduce their load during peak times, um, but the, the same does not apply. Uh, and there is no value to be gained as a residential customer uh, through trying to avoid those charges. So it's a big, big piece. You need, and, and, that, and that is where some defendant people who are proponents of programs say, because we haven't got, can't get pricing right for transmission, we need to find some kind of implied value uh, to mm -hmm. convey to these consumers uh, when they do reduce their demand during those uh, transmission allocative times, basically. Right. I would, I would go so far, I don't know how one would do it necessarily, but I would throw out the concept that there's also a time valuation of being able to get to distributed energy resources much more quickly than some of the transmission backlog that we've seen. Um, and it occurs to me that that's another component of value that could be Rep could be represented via programs and proxy price signals, um, in addition to what Travis is talking about, the, the actual uh, transmission charges that are showing up. And I'll just add that, obviously, it's a different story in Hawaii for transmission. We I have identified that transmission costs are you know, one missing piece of the puzzle of those, those value streams that I put up. Hawaiian Electric does has sort of uh, introduced this newer concepts that they're trying out for transmission planning in which they identify what they're calling as renewable energy zones saying here's where we have transmission capacity for additional large-scale renewables um and then working from there to figure out how that impacts the modeling if they're not able to put new renewable energy in those zones or how much it costs and so some of the modeling is able to take into account what that how that impacts the the value of DERs on the um, grid, but it's it's a very you know early uh, time in that sort of research. Hey, uh, thanks. I have a, a kind of a ungainly question, but it's uh, it really concerns the uh, juxtaposition of um, you know the value streams that uh, apply and might be harvested by a. a DER aggregator, you know, for the benefit of the local distribution utility and uh, and their participation or potential, potential participation as aggregators in wholesale uh, markets. Uh, potentially, is there a risk of uh, double counting or are there risks uh, of, you know, uh, complexities that get a little un ungainly uh, when they are essentially chasing uh, different uh, potential markets or, or clients? Is that a question anyone can take a stab at? I nominate Carmen. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid you might do that. I mean, I, I've heard this concern before of customer confusion of all the options that they may have when when I've talked about flex, flex markets in particular, because it does have an open door sort of strategy of let's have customers like work with aggregators that they um, are connected with, et cetera. And, and to me, it really comes back to um, a balance point of customers are on an energy journey today that we haven't really seen in the past with um, adopting electric vehicles and all those other things. And it occurs to me that um, the way we're going to get to the lowest prices for all of these different things is to be uh, have an open door policy on innovation, right? We don't know what's going to what the zinger technology is going to be and if we stick with just one or two like playing on my legacy again the compact fluorescent light bulb for example from energy efficiency legacy days um it's there's a high chance that we're going to put a lot of investments into a single technology and then uh not open the doors for other innovations and um different strategies that are going to be relevant going forward. And we're trying to solve a lot of things at the same time. So what I've really enjoyed watching with the flex markets is all the different types of uh, solutions that have come, come forward. And as long as they can demonstrate their impacts at the meter and they can get customers to adopt them, uh, they get a chance to play in the market. And we need all hands on deck. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Carmen. Thanks for uh, taking a, a stab at that uh, ungainly question. Uh, with that, I, I think we're going to have to uh, close the
this this out. I uh, I greatly appreciate uh, all three of you participating in this. I know the audience uh, certainly appreciated this as well. So uh, many thanks, and I, I think I'm just going to uh, close uh, things out uh, directly, unless uh, Jeff wants to jump in at the very end. And uh, yeah, and thank you, everyone. thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, uh, speakers. Um, a lot of great takeaways in here. I don't have a lot of time, but um, really like the, some of the contrasts that were drawn between prices and programs and, and the, the, the differences and similarities between them. Um, I did want to pick up on one thing to pitch. Um, there was a mention of planning and planning for DERs. And uh, we have a training coming up in a little over two weeks. It's the second of three training sessions on integrated distribution system planning. Um, and it comes along with a second day on resilience planning. Um, this one, this version is being held in Irvine, California. Uh, we'll be doing this same two day training in um, Nashville during the week of March 18th. Not sure which days exactly. Um, uh, we had a session, the first of these in December. Uh, sorry, November in DC. It was a big success. We got a lot of positive feedback, uh, some helpful suggestions that we're going to use to tweak some of the sessions. So we hope you will look for that on our website. I'm going to drop the link into the chat, which will be only there for a very brief time before we close this out. Um, but you can always reach out to us um, through whatever means you, you've got to reach us if you have questions about that. So again, thank you, Commissioner Allen, for your moderation um, uh, of this important topic. Thanks to the RMI team and Kara and everyone else who uh, helped put this together. And um, we will watch for news of the second module in this training curriculum. Um, we're gonna have more detailed webinars on uh, a few uh, emerging issues in this space where we'll get into detail um, about some issues that are current. And uh, they'll be more interactive and uh, we'll be generating some results from those interactive sessions to serve as resources and toolkits for you in the future. So watch for news on those. And I think that is probably enough said at this hour. So thanks very much. <laughs>